It's uh, good to see uh, such a large crowd here. I was, uh, I was told that this is going to be a bunch of retirees, and so uh, I guess there's not that many retirees here. There's one here, I see. Uh, a point. <laughs> and, uh, this, anyway, so uh, good to see so many um, uh, students here in the audience. Um, so today we're going to talk about a fairly large project that we've been doing in Tennessee for the last three years. And uh, as uh, Dr. Littman did mention, this is part of a larger USDA grant that we've got. So it's going to be trying to, it's a very large number of people involved with this uh, grant. And so before I continue, this is some of the principal, other principal investigators. Uh, there's about 26 people there. That's just the investigators. In addition to that, we could have another page of, uh, you know, technicians and support staff as well as graduate students. Uh, these folks that are involved in this, uh, this particular project come from the, the Institute of Agriculture. Um, as well as here on the main campus at Tennessee Tech University in Cookville, Middle Tennessee State University in Murfreesboro, University of Tennessee at Martin, and the University of Memphis. So we brought together quite a large team of people, many, many different disciplines, uh, many, many different perspectives. So uh, this is not all my work, this is their work. I'm just the, uh, I guess, the coordinator of this particular thing. I guess the, uh, the starting thing I'd like to mention is, you know, is climate changing? Um, yes, climate is changing. It's always been changing, and uh, it's, it's, the changes have been observed to be accelerating in recent years. Um, I've thrown up on the, uh, the slide here, we hear a lot of debate as to, you know, is this our problem here in Tennessee, or is this a problem some, somewhere else? But if you go back, and this is just the uh, data from the, um, the, the weather service, uh, this is the drought thing. So basically the darker the color, the more intense the drought. Everyone in Tennessee, going back 10 years ago, remembers the drought of 2007. We were right in the middle of this very, very dry area there. 2008, it continued in East Tennessee. 2011, it was kind of drier in most of Tennessee, not to the extent of the 2007. Similarly, in West Tennessee in 2012, and this part of the state in 2000, or last year, it was kind of dry. So just think, of in the last decade, we've had five drought periods. The big question is, how, how does this impact um, Tennessee agriculture, and what can we do to adapt to these changes? Um, when I look at agriculture in Tennessee, I like to go 30,000 feet and say, okay, we've got people involved in livestock production, how are they going to be impacted? We've got people involved in row crop production, how are they going to be impacted? <coughs> and so that's what we're going to be talking about. And if you want to walk out now, we're going to be talking about extending the grazing season for livestock. Uh, for crops, we're going to be talking about building soil resilience, and we're going to be talking about irrigation technologies. Floods, let's not forget about floods. Um, back about seven years ago, there was a fairly intensive flood that hit West Tennessee. This is a, a, a map of the, uh, where, where, the, uh, where this particular flood hit. Uh, there was about 13 or 14 inches in a 36-hour um, period. Um, biggest impact was seen in, uh, or where the news got it, was in uh, downtown Nashville. It was inundated. Uh, 26 people were dead, uh, 11,000 properties damaged, $2 billion in, in, in damages, infrastructure in Nashville alone, $125 million, and 300 to 400 businesses that closed and they probably never opened again. So one rain event, one weather event, significant damage in one particular part of the, uh, of the state, particularly in, in Nashville. Um, we've had recently had hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, you know, some people could say this is just normal hurricane patterns. We are in, you know, the hurricane area. But, um, and this is the, uh, again, it's a, a NOAA map showing how much excess water there is, the darker the green compared to average was in that particular period. Um, after Harvey came through, I was in Middle Tennessee, and they were mentioning that in a 24-hour period, they'd had eight inches of rain. Remember, this was the result of 14 inches of rain. Uh, eight inches of rain, it didn't go straight across Nashville, but it was pretty close. And uh, so these weather events, these flood events, and these rain and these uh, droughts are happening with increasing intensity. Um, <clears throat> another thing I like to talk about in, uh, when we talk about climate change and uh, things like that is that others are planning, therefore we should also be thinking about planning. This is a, um, a document produced by the United States Department of Defense, uh, that liberal organization that take these things pretty seriously. What they say in this particular document is uh, what 
our first step in planning these challenges is to identify the effects of climate change. So I think it's really important to, okay, let's look at all the facts and then let's base our um, strategies on climate change and how we might um, deal with that. Another really interesting thing, especially in this particular political era, is politics and ideology must not get in the way of sound planning. The other thing is we are not alone. No one country is responsible for it. No one country can solve it. We've all got to work together. And then the other thing is, if we basically don't do anything, we are going to increase global instability, hunger, poverty, and conflict. And the, uh, if you want to Google Department of Defense Climate Change, there's this very, very large document there. They're obviously planning for it. I think we should also be planning for it. <coughs> so I'm a soil scientist. I'm not a climate scientist. I don't claim to know anything about um, the, the science behind the, the modeling exercises they do. Uh, one of my... Uh, great mentors on this particular area was a guy called Tom Wilbanks. He worked at the National Lab. Uh, he gave, he's given several presentations. He um, adjunct professor at the University of Tennessee for 20 or 30 years. Another thing about Tom Wilbanks is uh, he was on the International Climate Change Panel. Also, a, uh, for that work, he was, got a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so if anyone's going to know something about climate change, this is the guy I want to talk to. It's a bit like if I need a heart transplant, I go to a heart transplant uh, doctor. I don't go to someone that's got no training in this type of thing. This is what uh, uh, Tom Wilbanks did. He gave a presentation a couple of years ago on the Ag Campus. And these are some of the things that uh, Tom was talking about. Was Yes, greenhouse emissions are going up. There's lots and lots of data to show that. We are ex experiencing uh, extreme events. And this was 2014, so he was referencing events 2011, 2012. Sandy was one of the things. And then he says, both higher magnitudes and rates of climate change and increased exposures to climate-related extreme weather events pose a new challenges to adaptation and resilience. Many, many discussions I had with Tom, unfortunately he passed away last year, um, were that let's stop arguing about the causes of climate change. It's happening. Let's deal with it. Let's not say it's not happening because it is happening and this is what we, uh, we need to be focusing on. Um, this is a graph here as part of the International Climate Change Panel where they basically uh, ran different models. And I'm not a modeler. I don't really understand how models work. I know they're very, very complex. But there was basically different scenarios they were looking at. A kind of low emissions, medium emissions, high emissions, and obscenely high emissions. These uh, extreme events. And basically what's going on is we are not following the track of the low emissions, we're not following the track of the high emissions or the, or the medium or the high, but these extreme events. And you can see this is 2014, we are following that track. So all the predictions in the past are not only uh, we're seeing the, the, um, the, the models are, are basically telling us the, the right story, but they're telling us what we would have thought in an extreme event. So these things are happening very, very quickly. These are some other things from uh, Tom's uh, presentation. Uh, it's um, kind of interesting things, yeah, higher temperatures, more severe and more frequent storms. Uh, interesting thing here, uh, sea level rise three to five feet in the next 30 years. The Gulf Coast is toast. Um, we've already seen that with some of these recent hurricanes, what happened with the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, surges in the, uh, in the uh, um, sea level. More, more floods and more droughts. And uh, so... This is what we're talking about in Tennessee when we're talking about predicted uh, climate change. We're going to be seeing more droughts and more floods. These are some other numbers from Tom's presentation. Again, this is the guy. This is, these are his numbers, not my numbers. And basically he's saying this is the number of days over 95 degrees. Um, in the coming decades, we're going to see more temperatures greater than 95 degrees. For agriculture, that's going to impact us. It's going to impact our animals and it's going to impact our crops in the field. Trends in water availability. There's going to be a decline in the amount of water that's available. So we're going to have hotter days. We're going to have less water available. How are we going to maintain our productivity and our production? Um, so other things is, you know, for us in, agric in agriculture, those of us <coughs> based on the ag campus, what are we going to do? We know these things are happening. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of debate in the, in the public, and it's a question of, are these normal events or are these parts of a, a pattern? The problem is, uh, once we know, recognize this stuff as climate change, it's too late. We've already, it's, gonna, it's you know, 30 years ago they started to take on this projection. Um, but the big question for uh, Tennessee agriculture is, if things are drier or warmer or wetter or cooler, 
how can we inform farmers to make decisions if we're going to have a, a, uh, a, a, warmer, um, a warmer spring, what impact does that have on the, on the fertilizers we use? If we're going to have a cooler, wetter spring, what impact is that going to have on the diseases and the pests we're going to expect? What kind of things do we need to do? Are we going to have to think about growing different crops? Are we going to have to think about uh, uh, producing things differently from the way we are doing today? Um, this is just some, some questions of what happens with livestock. You know, we've got a lot of livestock in Tennessee. Uh, what's that going to do you know, in terms of hay production? Hay, we typically grow hay for times when we don't have an actively growing uh, forage crop in the ground. Uh, what's that going to do with the animal's health and the hoof problems? What's that, what impact is that going to have on water quality issues? If we have more droughts, how can we produce our forage uh, if, it's not, if we haven't got enough rain? Uh, are we going to have to uh, you know, feed more of our animals in the summertime when typically we just feed them in the winter months? And how are we going to find the water to do that? So these are lots and lots of questions that we keep on asking. And again, these are some of the, the thing, issues relating to crop production. If we knew that we're going to have a wetter, cooler spring, we're going to know there's going to be changes in disease pressures, then we can make uh, management decisions as, as farmers to, uh, to do these uh, types of, of, of things. Quickly now talk about the, the start of this grant. This grant we uh, received um, in 2015. It's um, a five-year grant over um, it's five million dollars and these are um, it's a combination of research activities, extension activities and education. Typically grants were in the past just focused on research and nowadays there's a much bigger impact or, or emphasis on let's take that the results of this research out to the, uh, the farmers and the people that are going to impact. So my colleague Larry Tankersley in the back there, he's also from Extension, he works in the forestry area and so we, he and I are work, you're working with foresters on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm working with farmers on it. It's really important to get the results of the research into the hands of producers so that they can make educated decisions as to yes, I'm, that's a good idea Larry, I'm going to change my practices, you're talking sense, I may make some more money on this or not. Um, our initial focus for this particular uh, grant is uh, five watersheds uh, which we've selected across the, um, the Tennessee and the, the Cumberland uh, River basins starting in West Tennessee at the O'Brien River uh, we've got uh, the, uh, the Red River, the Elk River, the Ustanala Creek and the uh, Nolichucky. So basically to try and capture the variability we've got in soils and cropping patterns and agricultural systems across the, uh, the state of Tennessee. Um, now I'm going to go through a quick shopping list of some of the efforts. So basically the, uh, part of this grant, the research component, is a modelling effort. So we know there's going to be changes in weather patterns. We know there's going to be changes especially in the rainfall patterns. What's that going to do to the hydrology? So if the rain is coming in shorter, more intensive events, we're going to expect more runoff. That runoff, that water is going to go somewhere. What's that going to do to our stream flows and the management of our, our waters? TVA is particularly important, interested in this. How, is it, how are we going to manage our dams and our dam system? We know we're going to see more floods. Can we predict where those floods are going to be? And if we know where the floods are going to be, maybe we, we change the way we, we do our agriculture. Maybe we don't put the barn down next to the river next time or, or put all our expensive equipment next to the river. Maybe we need to put them on some higher ground. Uh, we know there's going to be more irrigation going in. There already is a lot more irrigation going in in West Tennessee. What impact is that going to have on the groundwater? So we're working with uh, the University of Memphis on that. The flood modeling efforts coming from Tennessee Tech. And then all this... This modelling is uh, going to feed some of our economists over on the Ag Campus to basically say, OK, with all this information, all these changes in, in potential practices, how is that going to impact the, the crops that we grow, the yields that we're going to get, and the, uh, the livestock that we produce? And then the um, extension side is basically how... These, these are myself and some of my, my, my colleagues, and extension specialists, working in the area of livestock management, row crop agriculture, as well as... Uh, nursery crop and uh, we're working at some of our research and education centers uh, across the state. So quickly go, this is a, a group, this is a, I asked these guys that were doing it to, to uh, give me a, one slide, so this is from Thanos uh, Papanikola's group out of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He gave me about 20 slides. These engineers can't be uh, succinct, but uh, this is basically what he's doing. He's, he's reusing this particular model, he's calling it the VIC model, and what he's doing is looking at uh, how does water enter the soil profile? How does it leave with these more intensive rain events? 
Uh, they're running different models in terms of what happens uh, to uh, the, uh, these are climate change models, what happens if we have lower emissions than expected or some of these higher emissions. Pay particular attention to these high emissions because this is where we're at. And this model, we started doing this modeling work in West Tennessee and we've, they basically they've calibrated the model. Uh, this is the kind of data that they're, they're looking at. This is the, the low emissions, this is the high emissions. Starting 1980, obviously we can calibrate. This black line is what's calibrated against given known data so we know the model is working. What happens when we put in the future predictions? And uh, basically what we're, we're seeing is, uh, so this is the, uh, the, you can see for temperature, yes, we are predicting this temperature rise uh, from the, the models that they're running. An increase of about three degrees by 2050. Doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, in the, the grand scale, scheme of things, when it's the difference between 95 degrees and 98 degrees, it can be quite significant. Soil moisture predictions, this is really important for us in agriculture and row crop production. Uh, you can see in the lower emission things, which is if it had been the best case situation, no, no real change. Whereas in the uh, higher emissions, we're going to see our soil moisture going down. So we're going to have to grow crops and grow forages with less soil moisture. How do we do that? Um, Thanos is also, Thanos is a modeling guy, so he loves the, uh, and these are a number of, of crop uh, models that he's done, and you can see, using this information, there's a general trend line to lower yields uh, forecasted with these main crops that we grow, given these different uh, climate change predictions. So that's the kind of hydrology group out of our civil and environmental group. This is the flood modeling coming out of civil and environmental from uh, Tennessee Tech. They've run into some challenges, and um, basically, I, I guess what we're saying here is uh, they are, um, we've done an awful lot of work, they're, they're still trying to get their model, model calibrated. The uh, LIDAR, this is high resolution uh, digital elevation models that they're able to do. There are some issues with that. They're trying to predict uh, flooding. Basically, all the LIDAR will do is will tell you where the top of the river is. It's not going to tell you where the bottom of the river is. So other things need to be done. They're also learning that the Mississippi has a great influence on the floods in that it back in large rain events the Mississippi is going to back up into the Urbine and that's going to So they're going to have to handle uh, these kind of things. So this is just a, a work in progress from the modeling group. From the economists, yes, uh, they've got to kind of look at where is all the water going to be coming in the future? Who got the demands for water? And they come up with these kind of interesting graphs. Basically, they're going to see our thermoelectrical production, the uh, nuclear power plants, they've got to stay cool. So there's going to be future demands and increasing demands uh, for water in that sector. Uh, what we're trying to do there is saying, you know, can we uh, uh, change, you know, are we going to see a big shift from dry land agriculture to irrigated agriculture? And there's some sh shifts, especially in West Tennessee, uh, but not any uh, real uh, significant things. And this is some of the shifts. And again, this is all modeling. This is early stages the, of the types of work that these guys are doing, trying to demonstrate the shifts in the, uh, the, from dry land agriculture to irrigation. So that's the kind of um, the big picture thing um, for um, where we are with the modeling exercises. Now, I live in the real world. Larry lives in the real world. What's going on in Tennessee agriculture? So this is a snapshot of Tennessee agriculture from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, annually we produce, we're worth about four billion dollars to the state's economy, an amazing amount of money. Kind of split between the livestock systems and the crop systems. Uh, it's slightly different, I think it's more like 40 percent now and more like 60 percent for the crops, but you can see some of the major commodities, major impacts. Um, I'm not including forestry there, Larry, I apologize. but. Uh, um, so these are some of our extension efforts in this associated with this particular graph. So this is our focus is if we're going to produce livestock, how do we produce livestock with less water? How do we maintain our forage base? With row crops um, for our uh, non-irrigated uh, row crop production, how do we improve our soils and our soil quality, our soil health, make those soils better able to handle these droughts and make these soils better able to handle these large rainfall events? We know there's going to be more irrigation. How do we make our irrigation better? How can we make better use of that water we've got? We've also got a, uh, a student that's working on, uh, she's just about to finish her PhD on nursery crop production. Just to give you a snapshot, this is, you don't think about it if you're not involved in agriculture, but we have a lot of animals grazing around Tennessee. 
uh, almost 2 million cows, uh, horses, 200,000. We often don't think of them as things, but horses have to eat as well, and then lesser of these uh, goats and, uh, and sheep. So these are the, uh, the large number of animals that we're having to feed through our forage systems. One of the big things that we've got in, in all we're trying to do is emphasize extending the grazing season. Historically, when rain has been pretty predictable, we've been focusing on what we call cool season grasses, things like fescue and orchard grass. Uh, these grow really well in the springtime, March, April, May, and then they typically go dormant in the summertime, and that's when we can, there's, there's nothing growing in the fields because these cool season grasses are, go dormant. So big thing is, can we start to grow things that grow well in the summer months so we can feed our animals during the summer months? Uh, obviously, the other thing that we're trying to do is, is maintain this grazing base. Rather than produce hay, hay costs money. You've got to drive a tractor with equipment uh, around. You've got to put up these bales. The quality of the hay is never going to improve. Uh, the quality of the grass is never going to improve through storage. It's only going to decline. So, Obviously, if we can feed our animals, which are designed to live on pastures, to feed them um, fresh forage. Uh, our aim is always to produce better quality forage, which is going to improve the, the performance of the animals. The other thing is, with these pasture-based systems where we're not concentrating our animals, we have a, a significant environmental impact. If our manure is spread around a, a field, it's not going to concentrate. When we have these large rainfall events, it's not all, all going to wash into the, the rivers. And then. Uh, the big thing is, if we are well geared to this, it doesn't really matter if we've got floods and droughts, because we've already you know, made that decision to, to take some of these things. This is just a graph showing typical grazing in Tennessee. Typically, this is what we're doing at the moment, this light color. These are the cool season grasses. So we've got good growth in the early spring and early summer. These grasses go dormant, and then they come active again about this time of year. What we're trying to do is fill in this space by growing warm season grasses. And, uh, this, has been, this is going to be a major emphasis um, our, of our things. So the other, we're not just, and these are some of the, the, the strategies we're promoting in grazing management. Obviously, uh, managing your pastures, managing the fertility, managing the, uh, the, uh, the stand. Uh, big thing, we're going to be talking a little bit more about adding these warm season grasses in there, using legumes. Legumes are nitrogen fixing plants, they add protein to the animal's diet, so that's really important. And there's other potential ways of getting more benefits out of our, uh, our grazing. Um, typically, again, our, our concept here is rather than grow 100% cool season grasses, let's have 75% of your pastures in cool season and about 25% in these warm season grasses. And we're really focusing on some of these native warm season grasses. These are the prairie grasses. These are the, prairie, these are the grasses that... Uh, uh, co-evolved in North America before you know humans were around in large numbers. Switchgrass, the big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, eastern grammar grass. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about these things. So we're doing a lot of work on these things and we've basically demonstrated that these grasses uh, produce uh, really high quality forage. You can maintain your production during the summer months when typically we would see our production of our animals go down. Uh, this is work that Pat Kaiser um, who um, is, all, is on this, um, as, as part of this team, has really been focusing. A lot of his work has been demonstrating the last 10 years how to grow these grasses, how to, uh, um, the benefits to, of growing them, and how the animals can. Now we're at the stage of, okay, let's start taking these out and getting some large scale demonstrations and showing farmers what we're doing. And uh, these are some of the uh, advantages. These things are much, very deep rooted plants. They go down two meters, two and a half, three meters in some places. So this is why they're drought tolerant. Rather than the fescues, which are narratively shallow rooted, these things will go down two meters. Uh, so even when it's really, really dry, you've got a new, really nice forage base to feed your animals. Um, that's one of the big, the other great things about these, uh, these grasses is when you do have a flood, because they're so well deep rooted, a lot of that water will infiltrate. So it's kind of, it, the, the fields become catch basins for water. You'll get less flooding. Uh, the um, the um, eight inch event I was talking about in Montgomery County, we were on some, I was with Pat that day. We were on a, a farmer's field and he basically said, look at my fields. The fields, the cool season fields were all still waterlogged after eight inches. 
the warm season ones had already drained. So we think this is also be able to adapt to the, uh, the, the droughts as well, and um, the droughts as well as the floods. And we get really strong gains. Uh, this is pictures of Montgomery County where we established a pasture. This was taken back in, I think, April. This is this field in uh, July. So we are learning how to grow these things. And uh, you can see the animals. This is the middle of summer. Normally, if you're on a fescue pasture, there's nothing growing. You don't have this lush grass. So this is a major emphasis that we're doing in our livestock area. Moving quickly to uh, row crops. So in row crops, this is the non-irrigated stuff. We know there's a lot of people going to stay without irrigation. What can we do to improve our soils and our soil management? Uh, we know if we don't disturb our soils, we maintain our soil structure, we maintain the ability for that soil to infiltrate water. And one of the things that we do is through no-till. Now, Tennessee already is a no-till state. We've got some of the highest rates of no-till adoption in the world. This is a system of um, uh, growing a crop where you don't disturb the soil. And this is a classic picture. This is probably taken in the 80s. This is uh, cotton or soybeans on a slope. Uh, we had a rainforest and we can see the clarity of the water. This is no-till, clear water on this side, tilled water. And uh, so the rates of adoption, we started in the um, early 90s. Now we're at a probably 85% adoption rate, some of the highest adoption rates in the world. And the reason farmers are doing it is because it is as good as tillage and even better. It's better because we use less equipment. We don't travel across the field with a harrow and a disc and a plow. We just go and we plant. And so it's cheaper to do no-till than conventional tillage. Our conventional tillage in Tennessee now is no-till. So we're already doing that. Um, this is some examples of looking at soil erosion numbers. This is using the revised universal soil loss equation. I don't go into the details of this, but basically if we run this, uh, this is a, 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 an equation that's used in every single county in the country by the NRCS, USDA. This is the kind of soil erosion rate that chose soil erosion rates in a ploughed system compared with a no-till system. So if we go from corn on this particular soil type, this is Gibson County, this is in West Tennessee, 64 tonnes of soil loss per acre per year by ploughing. If you convert to no-till, dramatic reductions, 90% uh, reduction to 1.4 tonne. Can we reduce that further? Yes, we can by growing a winter cover crop. Typically we harvest our crops and then over the winter there's no crop, there's nothing growing in the field. But if we did grow that crop in the field over the, um, over the winter time, we can further reduce our soil erosion rates. And there's other things, we actually see benefits to our, our soils as well. And uh, you can see um, even um, the soil, so basically yes, are we doing a good job? We're doing a great job. But can we do better? Yes, we can. And, uh, this is some examples of cover crops. Cover crops are single species, double, these are, are grass species, legume species. There's also some brassica species that we can put in to basically have something growing in the field after the main harvest so that uh, we're reducing erosion rates, we're capturing nutrients, we're, you know, more infiltration because of the roots, less erosion, we're conserving the soil moisture, we're scavenging in the nutrients, which is also good for water quality. One of the big things is we're learning is that we can suppress weeds. And weeds um, in this uh, part of the world are becoming more and more of a problem. We are getting resistance to some of our herbicides built up in the, the weed populations. And uh, so this is a really big one. We know we can reduce things. The big $64,000 question is can we we know we're going to improve the quality of our soil, the health of our soil. Can we improve the yields? And uh, for many, many years I was saying we're not going to really, we haven't seen, the, we don't see the data to improve our yields. So I'm not going to say, this is data out of last year, 2016, on this is an experiment we got at Milan, where we have uh, basically no cover crops, a rye, a rye vetch, rye, clover, wheat. This is a five species soil health mix. And last year in West Tennessee there was a bit of a drought. And we actually got a yield response with this multi-species uh, mix. So it shows us, yes, uh, don't grow cover crops to get a yield response every year. But when you get a dry spell, you're going to see a response. And this tells us that this approach to in, in, including cover crops into the, uh, into the mix is a good approach for the predicted more drought and uh, more floods because we get better infiltration rates. In terms of... Um, Irrigation, this is work that my colleague uh, Dr. Brian Leib is doing. He's our uh, 
uh, irrigation specialist with his uh, uh, associate uh, Tim Grant. Uh, work, we know we're seeing a lot more center privets going in in Tennessee. Um, unlike our neighbors in Mississippi and Arkansas that are still doing furrow irrigation, which uses a lot more water, we are pretty much center pivot irrigation. What he's looking at is what is a, 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 a system called deficit irrigation. So what we're trying to see is find the optimal minimal amount of water we can use and still get a uh, yield response. And he's got some great things to show. Yes, we can use a whole lot more water um, and still maintain those yields. We're also looking at drip irrigation systems. This, rather than spraying the water over the top, you were just dripping, dripping, dripping. Yes, he's demonstrated this with soybeans. Uh, we can get a fairly significant yield response growing the same yields with much less water. Um, other things that, that, uh, that Brian's involved with is looking at, well, if we're irrigating over sandy soils, do we, we, do we irrigate the same over clay soils? So obviously with clay soils, uh, much heavier soils, we don't need as much irrigation water. So can we change the amount of water we're giving these soils uh, based on the soil texture? And uh, this is, uh, I think we've got a slide after that. And also a lot of work done on looking at soil sensors, moisture sensors, to, 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 do, um, to determine these, these, these responses. So that's the kind of work we're doing on irrigations and uh, the, um, improving the efficiency. We've also got a, a graduate student. This is my colleague Amy Fulcher in plant sciences, who's our nursery crop specialist. And myself, we have a graduate student that's been looking at uh, can we improve the irrigation management in our nursery crop situation. Nursery crop production is very, very big in Middle Tennessee. We grow uh, crops in containers. And if you think about it, a 20-acre nursery every day from basically April till October, we're having to supply most of those pots with an inch of water or so. The current system is basically you irrigate and you watch for runoff to come out the bottom, leachate to come out. Very, very wasteful, not very good for the environment. Uh, what we've been looking at is uh, using pine bark. Pine, pine bark is the, is the standard uh, growing media we use in Tennessee, and amending it with biochar. Biochar is a uh, byproduct from pyrolysis and gasification, where you take a woody biomass in the absence of oxygen, and uh, we're basically trying to generate uh, syngases, hydrogen, to produce energy. Uh, there's a few operations in Lenore City and Lebanon that are now starting to produce some fairly significant quantities of this material. The big thing is, can we use this biochar, which is a carbon-rich material with very, very high water holding capacity, to amend these pots? And yes, uh, we've been able to demonstrate that uh, using hydrangea, this is our work over on the Ag Campus, using hydrangeas and sensors and things, we can actually significantly, depending on how we decide to, to irrigate, significantly reduce our water use while maintaining our uh, uh, productivity. I mean, this is a, a graph of uh, some of the work you can, the, the uh, number of irrigation events for the, where we, there's no biochar, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in this particular period. When we add 25% biochar, one, two, three, four, five. So we've halved the amount of water that's used just in this. I think this is probably a two-week event. And these are, are different ways of uh, irrigating. So that's some of the work that we've got going uh, with the, um, um, the nursery crop production. I don't want to forget some of the educational components. So our colleagues at uh, Middle Tennessee State University and University of Tennessee at Martin uh, are involved with some of the, the field research we're doing. So uh, we've got uh, uh, Song Chu and uh, Warren Gill. Warren Gill's since retired, but Song Chu is a, a, a faculty member at uh, Middle Tennessee State, as well as uh, Paula Gale and Greg Nail in, uh, at Martin. Uh, they have their students involved in lots of projects and integrating some of this stuff into the curriculum because our role as educators is to educate and to train the next generation of students to be prepared for uh, these are the, the exciting things that we're doing in agriculture and these are the exciting things that are going to be happening in the future and technology is really very important. Uh, we also have a, another extension person, uh, Lena Beth Reynolds, is working on a curriculum to, for 4-H uh, this is our youth education program, part of extension, looking at developing a curriculum on both water quality and water quantity. So hopefully to get that, we've got about half a million 4-H members in Tennessee. So the big thing is to educate 
you know, as many people as possible about these things. And uh, with that, I think I kind of open up for some questions. I know I've kind of raced through this a little bit. There are some things that, you know, we know our models aren't perfect. We know we can improve our models. We know there are things in our models that need to be changed. And some of the things, for example, if we're, you know, suddenly start to grow much more of these deeper rooting uh, forages in Tennessee, we're going to have more infiltration, less runoff. That's going to change our hydrology modeling issues. It's going to change our flood models. We know there's some differences in the technologies. We know uh, farmers are, uh, there's much, some of the planting technology we have, uh, we are planting um, much larger fields, much quicker. Instead of planting at four miles an hour, we can now plant at 10 or 12 miles an hour. And so farmers like to have big fields. So we're seeing a lot of smaller fields being merged into larger fields so that we can take advantage of this new technology so that we don't have to turn our tractors so often. Uh, that, that's great for agriculture, makes agriculture more efficient, but what's that going to do to our hydrology? We're going to have more runoff from these larger fields. There's less barriers to their thing. So these are some of the things we're also trying to look at. What future uh, technology changes are going to happen in agriculture that may impact some of our things. But I think this is a kind of exciting exciting way of, you know, ex exciting time for this type of work. And uh, this type of work is going to carry on. And uh, we will adapt. I've got great confidence in that. And I think we'll be um, successful in the future. With that, I'll um, ask for any questions. Yes? Have you factored in the effect of thousands of acres a year that are growing out of cultivation and end up development and housing and things of that sort? There is a lot of development going in, and yes, and your your point is well taken. Um, this particular th we are we're aware of that, and I've got other colleagues that are working on that issue. Uh, just this last week, the uh, Tennessee Stormwater Association had their uh, annual meeting at Fall Creek Falls. And uh, what we're dealing with in those situations is rather than if we do have development, let's make this development smart. So low impact development, things like uh, pervious pavements, um, rain gardens, capturing the, uh, the runoff, making sure that when we do have these large events that all that water doesn't go rushing down the uh, thing. So yes, we are very aware of that. And uh, there are other groups in t at the University of Tennessee working on that. So California has Yes, I mean, the, the, um, the California, you know, they do have, it's, it's kind of interesting, that graduate student of ours who um, was working on the nursery crop, the graduate student that's working on the nursery, she just interviewed at the University of California for an irrigation position. So they, uh, you know, so th this, the, the things that we're working on here is exactly what California is interested in as well. In the past, uh, water was fairly abundant. Now it's not going to be, and we've got to be much more smarter in our water use efficiency. And yes, California, there are some parts of California that are very efficient in their water use, but there's still a lot of, of work to be done by everyone. Yes? How are you going to be able to go forward to get money for this planning and implementation in an administration that says there is no climate change? Um, that's a politically charged thing, and so um, I'm, I'm, I think what we do is we repackage our, 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 um, our message. And uh, I, I, I go, I travel around the state, I meet with farmers groups, and there are some issues that farmers mention about, you know, quote unquote, I believe in climate change or I don't believe in climate change. I may not be a believer in climate change, but I know last year there was a drought. And uh, whether that's just a normal weather event or not, I know that drought caused me problems, and I know I have to change uh, the way I do things. Uh, as I mentioned in the, um, you know, talking about some of the ways we, we, we package our message, uh, no one is against building soil resilience, making our soils healthier, more productive. Um, it also happens to sequester carbon, which, you know, mitigates from the, the high CO2 levels in the atmosphere. But it also makes our, you know, 
better infiltration. So there are things that we, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's unfortunate the, uh, that the current political climate is the way it is, but I don't think it's going to kill the efforts that we're doing. And I mean, we, I live in a, a data-driven world. If, unless I see data, I'm not going to say we will do this. And this is why we do this type of work. Yes? Yes. Is anybody looking into using the same fields for both crops? Was so one go dormant, the other springs up? This is. This, I, I didn't go into a whole. I mean, this, I could spend a whole hour talking about these warm season forages versus these cool season forages. Mm -hmm. Basically, the way you grow these uh, or get these, these grasses established is, and the way they are managed is quite different. Mm -hmm. So you can, it, 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 it sounds like it would work, but it would be, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. So we, we need to have these separate fields. And the other thing is, you know, you graze your animals on the cool season uh, fields, March, April, May, and then you let them rest during the summer months when normally you'd have the animals on there over grazing, causing all sorts of potential environmental problems. And then you move them to these lush, you know, well, uh, pro provided for uh, warm season grass. So that's the yes, and, and that's the whole thing is, and that's another thing is, you know, in pasture systems we are limited by the stocking density. We can't have, you know, if we have 300 cows per acre, we've got to bring food in. If we've got, you know, one cow per two acres, we can provide enough forage. So that's the uh, other other thing that we need to be paying attention to. Yes. Um, well, uh, you are uh, looking at ways how to 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 adapt uh, agriculture to climate change, but agriculture causes climate change also. So, are are you your technology the, the things that you are studying? Are they uh, gonna solve that problem? Like how uh, uh, reduce the uh, climate change in impact uh, of agriculture? So. So the question is how agriculture can also impact climate change. I think you're talking about, you know, every time we till the soil, we release carbon dioxide into the... So one of the things that we're doing in Tennessee is we are no-till. And we know that we, can, we are sequestering carbon. So typically a soil in Tennessee that's been tilled for a long time is going to have less than 1% organic matter. Once, it's been, once we go to no-till, we start to accumulate that, that organic matter, and we can go from less than 1% to 3% in 20, 30 years. Doesn't sound like a whole lot, but multiply that by many millions of acres of, I mean, 44% of land use in Tennessee is agricultural. Then we can start to have an impact. And yes, can we do better? Yes, we can. But uh, are we as big of a bad of a problem that we used to be? No, we're not. Are there things that we can do? Yes. And we've, uh, uh, seven years ago, I gave a talk on some of the work we're doing in Africa on conservation agriculture, and we were able to demonstrate through different, uh, you know, measurements that yes, that carbon was going into the soil and we were, ha were having a net positive effect. So you, your point is well taken. I think there needs to be some, that's another area of potential policy decisions on can we, can we reward farmers for sequestering carbon? And there's, you know, the issues with the carbon markets and things. It was a big, big thing in uh, Europe a few years ago. It's in Australia. It's kind of died down. It's become less um, politically uh, uh, good thing to do, but should we be able to do that? I think that's another thing that we should be, we've got to look at all poten potential options. Yes? Uh, in, your, in your opinion, um, are the steps we're taking right now happening fast enough uh, to prepare us for you know, the, the next stage in climate change? Are we making the changes fast enough? So, I mean, I don't want to get political on this, but there are some things going on which are actually trying to reverse the things that already are in place, which makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, fortunately, economics is a driver. So some of these things of, you know, we're going to bring back all the coal jobs, we know economically that's not going to happen. We know there are other technologies, these renewable energy things, we know that's going to happen. So I'm, I'm confident that the markets and economics is going to be the, the driver. It's the same way as a lot of the things that farmers are doing economics is the driver. And yes, we can start by encouraging people to do things, but ultimately the marketplace is going to take over. So I, I think, I'm, I'm confident. It's just, uh, we're in this kind of rough sea at the moment. And uh, Larry, you want to make some comments on the forestry world? If you live long enough and look for positive things, more positive things are happening. For us 
us hippies from the 70s, <laughs> they, these things are not uh, going backwards. Uh, we, we are making great strides. It's very incremental. And if you listen to the wrong media, it can sound very, very negative. But the thing that I'm excited about is all the students that are here today, uh, Y'all are the future, and agriculture is not that politically incorrect. We're, we work every day as much as Mr. Walker has, has proved to you, is, is displayed here. There's, there's great things we do in agriculture every day using very, very sophisticated high technology. So if you aspire to be a, 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 a rocket scientist, well, we, we're not physicists in, in, in agriculture, we're biologists. But we use some pretty sophisticated biology. So don't, you know, if you really want to change the world, agriculture is a potential place to do that. And, and what I would say is, is, is uh, again, and, and Walker's got international experience. To your question, all of our scientists do worldwide uh, literature searches. We have the, the internet now, and we know what's happening in Africa. We know what's happening in Eastern Europe. We know what's happening in California. Almost immediately. So any technology that we're using is, is almost cutting edge right here in Tennessee. And when you look at no-till, uh, no-till was brand new technology in the late 70s. And now it's standard operating practice here in Tennessee. And, and all around the world. So, you know, I, I apologize for forgetting too too uh, carried away, but I, I do think that if you live long enough and over a 40 year span, things have changed and, and I can't help but agree with, with Forbes, they're not going to be irreversible because if you study resource economics, which is another thing, and political policy, those things are all mixed in the rubric with, uh, with us as, as yeah. agricultural biologists. I, I think I think you just have to, I mean, I always use the example of Townsend at the turn of the last century. Right. Lots and lots of trees, the company moved in, everything was clear cut. If you look at pictures of the Townsend area, Great Smoky Mountain National Park from the 1920s, you'd think, this is a moonscape, this is a disaster, why did we do this? Go today, you know, nature was able to recover as well as with some good management and some policy things. So I think... Yes, the, uh, the glass is half full, not half empty. Yes? If you want to see a comparison to what you just said, go to Townsend and then drive over and take a six mile hike in, in Greenbrier. Greenbrier was all farms in 1924, and that's all trees. Yes. Uh, you were talking about the economics, the uh, drip irrigation. Is it economically better than the uh, no, at, at the moment it is not. But this is why we do things in science. We do things that are not economic at the moment to prove the concept. Can we get better yields using less water through drip irrigation? And then in the future, who knows what's going to happen? But yes, no, so, you know, cotton production, cotton is a relatively low value crop. Drip irrigation works well in these high value crops. Uh, but um, who knows what the economics are going to be in the future. But yes, you're, you, you, your point is well taken. It's not economic, but we've demonstrated that we can increase yields through using less water, but just applying that water when the plants need it. Yes? So, obviously, there's been all this great research in studying how we can change agriculture to better produce the things that we eat. But how do you think there can be a change in culture to also affect what we eat and how that affects? I mean, obviously, the farmer has to make money, but I think the big thing is I mean, the big thing is people need to be educated as to where their food comes from. And uh, I think a lot of people saying, "Well, I'm eating healthy. I'm eating this sushi, for example, which was harvested off the Sea of Japan three days ago." And yes, that's great. Uh, you are eating healthy as a health, but look at the, your carbon footprint of bringing that thing. The strawberries I had this morning 
for breakfast came from California and the, the calories that I consumed today uh, were less than the calories that it took to get those strawberries to my, my plate. So we need to be smarter, uh, understand where our food's coming from and, uh, and based on that. So yeah, that's, I think that's what we, we need to do. Too many people have been, are disconnected from the food production system. There's only 2% of the population in the US are actively involved in, in agriculture. And uh, when, you know, so there is this thing. And I see, I mean, some of these labeling things drive me nuts. You know, when people, organic, gluten free, GMO free, give me a break. <laughs> gluten free vodka. I mean, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever. Anyway, that's, that's my personal but, peeve. But also, like, if, um, like if, if all this research is saying that, you know, the, the droughts are happening and, and it's, it's affecting our crops and our yields of other agriculture or livestock, then shouldn't there be a reduction in those fields in order to help mitigate that? So where there is a drought someplace, there's, not, there's going to be a bumper crop somewhere else. And that's just the way the, the global markets work. And so, yes, farmers are the ultimate optimists. So every farmer is going to plant a crop this year because it's going to be a bumper crop. And uh, the... There are, there are certain programs, USDA has got certain programs where they're taking some of the less productive land out of production and uh, so these conservation reserve programs. So there are efforts there and I think farmers are starting to recognize. Now, if this part of the field I never get a good yield, why am I farming it? And we've got all sorts of data to say, you're actually losing money. You're putting inputs into this part of the field you shouldn't be farming it. You should be focusing on the high producing parts of the field or high producing fields. And uh, yes, so yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, winter cover, cover crops cost effective enough to sell to farmers? This is another, you're asking, that's a good question, because yes. So the um, cover crops, there's many, many benefits of growing cover crops. Uh, but it's really difficult to make them pay at the moment. Right, because farmers uh, are extremely economical people, and if you say there's benefits to the soil, are they going to see economic benefits? And so that's why we're doing this. So you'll see, in that last year, that was the fourth year we'd done that, we'd had no yield response from going, growing cover crops in terms of yield. But uh, that year, 2016, we saw a yield response growing that one package of cover crops. That's one thing. The other thing is this uh, resistance, this uh, herbicide-resistant things that we're seeing in our weed population, cover crops, I think, are going to, that's where we're going to start to see them pay for themselves. Because growing a cover crop before you grow the next one is going to help you. Um, you're going to cut out some of the really expensive herbicide applications you need. So it's not a direct saving, it's not a direct benefit, but you're going to save money in, in other areas. Um, we're also looking at uh, cover crops that may have some sort of uh, economic uh, potential. I know up in Minnesota, there's a, a group where they're actually looking at growing cover crops, and in the cover crop mixes are some crops that produce some really high-value essential oils. And yes, the yields are really low, maybe a ton or half a ton per acre if you've got this, but these are oils that you, you, you need to use in the pharmaceutical world. So yes, could we be growing some of these high-value things and getting, making the, the returns on our investment that way? But uh, yeah, the point is well taken. Was there another question? Yes. Are you aware of, with the upcoming Farm Bill, are there any um, incentives or provisions for climate adaptation, crop insurance or anything? Any I, I have not, I should have, but I've not kept up with what's going on in the, the current Farm Bill. I don't believe, given the current uh, climate, <laughs> excuse the pun, in uh, this, in this country, that there's probably going to be much climate ch change language in there, if any. But I think a lot of the things are going to I mean things that we're talking about. The, the the farm bill is really very focused. It's not so much focused on agriculture. Agriculture. There's a lot of conservation measures in that farm bill to encourage conservation practices. And so while everyone looks at the farm bill as this, you know, just agriculture benefiting, there's, there's lots and lots of emphasis on conservation practices. Larry, do you have any better idea about what's going on in the farm bill? Uh, I think you you said it very well earlier. You you just read you kind of avoid the terminology climate change because we're going to have to deal with the climate as it is. Whether it changes or not, we've got to grow a crop this year, next year, <coughs> 10 years from now. We've got a lot of people in the world to feed. That's a huge problem worldwide. I always admired the folks working in Africa. So regardless of, of the forecast, 
And I think you, you nailed it also earlier for when you said the most of the debate is how climate change is, is being caused. I, I know it doesn't snow nearly as much as it did when I was a kid 50 years ago. Whether that's driven by fossil fuels or not, it's happening. So I don't know that we need verbiage that actually addresses climate change as a, as a word or, or, or a, a, a politically charged terminology, but the farm bill still has to address when you've got to grow food to feed people. So, you know, that's kind of where we're coming from in agriculture. We kind of try to stay out of, out of farming policy, which is, is, is impossible, <laughs> you know. But that's why we have colleagues that are professional politicians. So even if you find yourself in political science as an academic endeavor, which is a, 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 a highly admirable thing, it, it still is going to be brought to bear in an agricultural setting. So, so what I'm saying is, is every academic endeavor here at UT probably has an application in agriculture. And I'm really not trying to hustle you uh, per se to recruit you to come over to agriculture. I'm just saying, as a citizen of the world, you're already involved in it. So, thanks. By the way, a previous speaker had said in lieu of uh, the climate change that weather pattern was the uh, more palatable Substitute. Yes. By the way, this this is one of our uh, almost one of our record attendances of, of this space, and we apologize for the, the the small space here. Once the new student union space comes online, that uh, then we'll have more space for this. But appreciate. It. But I, I'm curious about this. Uh, how many of you students uh, the students in here uh, like to have you raise your hands? How many are, are from UTIA or part of the ag operation? And how many are university side? And so you don't know where you're going. <laughs> that, that's an interesting mix because it really has been a significant uh, turnout, and some other students had to leave from classes and so forth. And let's uh, all thank Dr. Walker. And if you.